Coming up on DTNS, are we done with Ethernet ports? Social networks served your way, kind of like at Burger King. And how Amazon circumvented the Apple App Store with Apple's help? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 25th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Also in Los Angeles, I'm Lamar Wilson. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Shane. We were just talking about uh, a little check-in on my use of the Microsoft Surface Duo. We were talking about uh, how our parents wanted us out of the house when we were kids. <laughs> That's all a good day internet. Uh, get it by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The European Commission announced it will appeal a July 2020 ruling, which had overturned a $15 billion fine against Apple and Ireland over taxes. The EC considered the tax breaks to qualify as unallowed state aid. If the appeal proceeds, it will be heard by the European Court of Justice. The Verge confirmed that torrent files containing source code for Windows XP and Windows Server 2003 were published on several file sharing sites. Now, it's not clear how much source code was included in the leak, although one expert confirm Microsoft's net meeting user certificate root signing keys were included. Earlier this year, a leak of the original Xbox and Windows NT 3.5 source code appeared online as well. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, uh, said Thursday that an attacker gained access and copied data from an unnamed federal agency. The attacker used compromised Microsoft 365 accounts to view help desk email attachments, and in those attachments was able to find things that led them to get access to domain administrator accounts and credentials for the agency's Pulse Secure VPN. They were also able to access the Active Directory to modify settings and study the internal network. CISA's Einstein intrusion detection detected the attacker, and that's how they discovered it and stopped it. Five days after U.S. Magistrate Judge Laurel Beeler issued a preliminary injunction against a ban on WeChat in the U.S., the U.S. Department of Justice asked the court to stay that injunction over national security concerns. Essentially, these are fights over whether banning WeChat or leaving it up will cause more damage, while the issue is decided in court. Meanwhile, Tencent proposed a resolution that would create a U.S. version of the app, partner with a U.S. cloud provider, and manage the app through a U.S.-based entity. The judge department said that Tencent retaining ownership did not address U.S.'s concerns. Hmm. TikTok's Australian executives told Australia's Select Committee on Foreign Interference through Social Media, that's a long one, <laughs> that it would uh, let the government review TikTok's code. Now, government personnel could review TikTok's algorithm and test its source code at a Transparency and Accountability Center in Los Angeles or Washington in the U.S. Mac rumors spotted that Apple has removed the 5-watt USB charging brick that previously came with the pricier Apple Watch Edition and luxury Hermes models. Uh, at Apple's event earlier this month, they announced they were doing away with the power brick to reduce environmental impact, but only mentioned it would be gone in Series 6, SE, Series 3, and Nike models, not in these higher-end models. So it appears no more charging bricks at all for the entire Apple Watch lineup. I have I can't never seen it. an Hermes model in the wild. <laughs> Not that I know of. Not once. You should sure buy they're one. out there somewhere. Yeah, I should. I know. I, cheap. I mean, what am I going to do with all this money otherwise? New Patreon level. Sky News reports that days after Airbus announced its plan to convert its fleet to hydrogen power by 2035, a company called Zero Avia has completed the world's first commercial hydrogen-powered zero-emission flight after taking off from an airfield in Bedfordshire, England. The 20-minute test flight included a pretty small six-seater plane running on a single propeller, not exactly Airbus-sized, but it's a start. Zero Avia says it plans to make these flights available within three years. Twitter is expanding a test feature it introduced to Android in June, prompting users that were about to retweet an article they hadn't clicked open to read it first. Twitter says users in the test group open articles before sharing them 40% more often than they did without the prompt, and users open an article and then retweeted it 30% more than they did without the test prompt. I like this. Hmm. All right, let's talk a little more about Chromecast with Google TV. Normally, we, we avoid talking about too many rumors, but this one's pretty solid because a Reddit user called FuzzTub07 shared photos of a Chromecast with Google TV they bought at a store. Uh, so this isn't leaked photos. They have the thing. 
Uh, a video showed the Google TV interface with what appears to be Android 10 underlying it. Uh, it supports 4K HDR multiple accounts and Bluetooth headphones, does not have an Ethernet port. The remote has a YouTube and a Netflix button. The Redditor who posted this said they bought the device from a Walmart outside Pittsburgh for $50 and noted that it seemed to be in stock at a store in Ohio as well when they looked online. Chromecast with Google TV isn't announced yet. It's still <laughs> Android TV as far as Google officially says, but we're expecting to get an announcement about it at Google's Pixel event, which is coming up Wednesday, September 30th. Yeah. Man, this is a, this story has multiple levels. The first yeah. one is, <laughs> the first one is, so Walmart stocked an unannounced product uh, so one might think then that whatever Google announces is going to be available immediately where the stores wouldn't have it yet. Right. Makes uh, sense. You know, and, and on that note, that's pretty bad communication because, you know, Google either didn't make it clear to this particular Walmart and any other Walmarts that this also applies to, please don't put these on the shelves yet <laughs> and price mm -hmm. them at $50. Or the store is just super unorganized and it happened internally. But you know, then you've got the Chromecast with Google TV that this particular Redditor, you know, took videos and photos. And I mean, it's all the information you need. It's, it's darn near a presentation in itself. So I don't know what's left to, to, to not know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Google must have said something about don't put this on the shelves or they would be at, on the shelves at every Walmart. But there right. are some scattered reports that are unconfirmed that people have found them on the shelves at other Walmarts around the country. So something broke down uh, somewhere, for sure. Yeah, w Walmart is definitely notorious uh, for, for doing that. You know, they've done what some Nintendo releases to where they kind of get them early and put them on the shelves, not thinking. Um, then they got to take them off. But yeah, a couple of things I found interesting about this. Number one, uh, you mentioned the, the, the no Ethernet port, and that's... That's interesting mm -hmm. because Chromecast have traditionally, and I know this is not a Chromecast, but traditionally it had one. So is Wi-Fi better now or going? are they betting that Wi-Fi is going to be as good that you don't have to plug in anymore? That's something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to think about. And also, and I know it's an article that, uh, at least at the time, Stadia was not supported. So, right. you know, that did not appear not, to be on this. Did not appear this to be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which would be weird really weird if that wasn't like included in it because that's literally one of their flagship gaming products yeah because so. there, there were apparently a couple of games pre-installed or on it or at least available for download you know yeah. promoted etc uh but it is a chromecast it's a chromecast dongle it's just you know it's mm -hmm. going to be the introduction of google tv and you're right no ethernet port i mean maybe that's why it doesn't have stadia because they're like well without an ethernet port you know so maybe there's another model out there that does have an ethernet port for stadia so mm -hmm. you get all the speed but it does sort of indicate that we are to the point where Wi-Fi is good enough for your streaming video. I remember there was a time in my life where I would not stream video on any device that wasn't connected to Ethernet if I wanted it to be reliable, right? I'm not talking you, about watching. Even your watching. phone. You put yeah, your well, no, I'm, I'm talking about like if I was like, I'm going to watch Netflix. I'm gonna, I don't want to be interrupted by buffering for the next hour or hour and a half for a movie or something. Uh, I would have Ethernet. These days, none of my stuff's plugged into Ethernet. It's all using no. Wi-Fi and same, same here. I, mean, I yeah, haven't had an, I haven't office. had yeah. an Ethernet connection to my media uh, in years, like five years, more maybe more. Uh, but it also used to be that my router was like stuffed behind my TV, so I was like, "Well, it's as close as it can be." Now it doesn't even matter uh, because my Wi-Fi is reliable. Not everybody, you know, has the luxury of that, but I think we're getting to that point. Yeah, so. I think the only thing I really have plugged into Ethernet is this machine that I'm on right now. Same. I would, it's, the, it's the only thing I have plugged into Ethernet because, you know. And my Wi-Fi router, obviously, is right. plugged <laughs> into the boat. That's how it all works. <laughs> all right. Apple confirmed that it acquired the podcasting startup Scout FM earlier this year. Scout FM curated podcasts based on your listening history using machine learning to adjust recommendations. And after the acquisition, well, this is what happened. Scout FM shut down service on iOS, Android, and Amazon. It's funny because I did not use Scout FM on either iOS, which is how I listen to pretty much all my podcasts, but it also had a CarPlay app, and mm -hmm. I didn't realize that because uh, I'm always looking for new CarPlay apps because I love my CarPlay. So I didn't ever use Scout FM. Got to hope that the team has been absorbed so that Apple might do something that's a little bit along these lines as far as recommending podcasts that I might like in their podcast app based on what I've listened to. But it's 
difficult to compare that to music. You know, Tom and I were talking in the pre-show with music. It's like you can listen to a hundred songs pretty easily. And there's a lot of genres of music that are very cut and dry. Well, you know, mostly with yeah. podcasts. It's like, I listen to lots of stuff that I would not consider it to be a genre of anything. It just podcast hosts that I like. And, yeah. and if I get a recommendation for something else, It'd be awesome if that worked because I know there are a ton of podcasts that I'm never going to discover because there's millions of them and some of them might be right up my alley. So this could be helpful, but it's a, it's a tougher sell. Well, just, just trying to use machine learning to make uh, recommendations. You need a big data set. The bigger your data set, the better your recommendation. Hundreds and hundreds of songs. I've got a good data set of lots of different things you like that, that will make that machine learning recommendation work better. 12 podcasts. That's not a big data set. Like, can you really tell a lot about what somebody likes based on 12 podcasts? I mean, there's other data points, like how long they listen, how often they listen, which episodes they pick, uh, I suppose. But but yeah, it just doesn't seem like the kind of thing that would be quite as good, but maybe it is. I mean, Spotify does it too. They do recommendations for podcasts, not just songs. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about uh, Google Podcasts. You know, Google has the biggest data set, right? All your searches and things. That's one of the reasons mm. why I think I like Google News so much, because it, it kind of knows what I'm you know, looking for throughout the week and it, it curates articles. So for, po you know, I haven't used their podcast uh, thing in a, in a couple of years. I think it's integrated in the YouTube music. I'm not sure. Uh, but I'm, I'm interested to know if, 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 you know, if it's, if that one recommends as well as this would do, because Apple doesn't have a search type of thing. And then, you know, they're very privacy centered. So how would they gather that data? So yeah, Google has its own standalone do. podcast app. They took it they out of now. Google Music. Okay. As they were moving everybody to YouTube Music, they took, they're like, okay, we're going to take it out of Google Music, so we got to have this podcast app. Gotcha. It's also, no matter what podcast app you use, if there's a top-rated, it's always the same 10 or 20 podcasts. And they're right. great mm -hmm. podcasts. I listen to a lot of those as well. But I think that this is... Well, not I don't really know what Apple's doing, but assuming that they're trying to use this technology for themselves, this would be a great way to kind of expand that. Like, okay, we know that This American Life is always going to be in the top five, right? It's a great podcast, awesome. You know, download it, listen, install, listen each week, or don't. But there are lots of others, and that makes the whole ecosystem a lot more compelling, especially for people who are kind of just getting into podcasts. Mm -hmm. How about another social network? Uh, former Quora execs are rolling out invites for a new social network called Telepath that they say prioritizes moderation over user numbers. Now, the rules are this. Be kind. Don't be mean. No harassment. And no fake news. More specifically, it bans all identity-based attacks, doxing, harassment, porn, and violence in links, images, and words. So Telepath is trying to focus on interest rather than friends. Now, users can follow a variety of conversations such as funny tech memes, failing companies, global innovation, entertainment, etc. Um, perhaps more interestingly, Telepath deletes all posts after 30 days. Now, the Telepath CEO, Richard Henry, says taking moderation seriously requires the entire moderation team to be in-house and that we're not going to outsource it to a contracting company, which is what every other major network, network does, essentially. So to sign up, People have to use a real validated phone number and agree to community rules. Um, I'm kind of in intrigued by this, especially the the 30 days. Everything is gone. The, the the slate has been wiped clean. Um, I did sign up for it. You know, it, it's an invite only. But I, I'm I'm curious of the need for a nice Mr. Rogers place where I can <laughs> feel good and you know feel comfy and and safe and that everybody's gonna be nice to me. Because that does not exist anywhere else. <laughs> it's nice to be nice. I mean, there are a lot of things about this that sound pretty good, right? It's, okay, you're following topics rather than users, so there's no, you know, a massive, you know, following makes you feel better about yourself. Doesn't matter. Uh, the ephemeral quality, the, you know, everything's gone after 30 days, so it's kind of like have your conversation and then move on. You know, there's no, you know, going back 200 days and saying, you said this, you know, and now I'm mad at you kind of thing, which is somewhat freeing. And mm -hmm. then using a real validated phone number, I mean, that takes it a step farther than Facebook. Facebook, well, with some exceptions, uh, wants people to use their real names. But Twitter doesn't even care. I mean, all you need is an email address, so there's a little bit more of a um, taking account accountability here. I just don't, I think with a lot of the Facebook alter alternative social networks, what was the one that started with a year? There was one that was- It was LO. Uh, 
It was it was L O. Yeah, it was you know that kind of kind of came and went. Uh, it just it's just really hard to fight uh, a social network that's that big. Not that Facebook's the only one, but it's sort of you know the grand social network that nobody can really penetrate as far as user numbers. This is something different. I think that if you really are looking for an alternative and you don't care about where everybody else is and you like the folks that you're talking to on a particular topic, it's not unlike Cora, really. Cora is more question answer, you know, mm -hmm. let me be an expert to help you because you want to know something and I have the answer. But that's a feel good place as well. I, I like the idea of this. I just don't know how it scales and maybe they don't care. Yeah, the 30 day thing was the thing that caught my eye first was the you know, the fact that posts Same. expire. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Takes a little pressure off, even if it's just psychologically. I mean, how many of us really look at 30 day old posts, but you don't think, well, if I write this, it'll be here forever, right? So that that changes your approach. I hadn't even thought about the idea that you don't come here to follow people, you come here to follow topics, which takes away that barrier of like, well, I would use telepath, but none of my friends are there, right? You're like, oh, well, I don't care if my friends are there. I'm going to follow the I hate Joe Biden thing or I hate Donald Trump thing or whatever it is, because they have both of those, by the way. Uh, so, so yeah, it could attract people for topic-wise. We'll see if that works. The other thing it reminded me of is Parler. Uh, Parler, I use because it says, we are only going to moderate what is illegal. Uh, everything else is free. It's the opposite of telepath. They're like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're tired of being moderated too much on Twitter and Facebook, come to Parler and we will only moderate something if it's against the law. There's a court precedent. There's a law against it, like inciting violence, something like that. So telepath is kind of a different like, well, for the people who think there isn't enough moderation on Twitter and Facebook, we're going to step in and provide a different experience. I wonder if there is a future where instead of Facebook and Twitter, we have balkanization of social networks where people who want less moderation go to Parler, people who want more moderation go to Telepath. Maybe there's other spins on it. One's topic oriented, one's people oriented. I don't know. It's interesting to think about whether these will gain traction even with their smaller audiences. Or or, or we could have kept Google Plus and then everything would have been right with the world because it was a perfect place. And I'm you still keep salty. telling yourself that, yeah. I, I'm salty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know who's not salty? Apple. Uh, they're Ooh. softening it up on one requirement anyway for in-app purchases. Facebook lets users offer paid online events and doesn't take any fees, at least for now. But Apple was insisting, hey, if you put a payment in an app, even if you don't take any money out of it, Facebook, we get our 30%. Well, Apple has offered a reprieve on that and given Facebook until December 31st to implement Apple payments for Facebook events. But until December 31st, Apple will let events be processed through Facebook Pay, and Apple will not take 30%. So it's a temporary reprieve, and Apple's saying it's to give Facebook a chance to restructure around our system. How, how gracious. I mean, how are they going to restructure besides Facebook also charging people for online well, events? They're going to restructure by putting in Apple Pay, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's what it's for. It's it's for Facebook to figure out a better way to incorporate Apple Pay into events on their Facebook app. But yeah. Well, you got till December. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking of apps and paying, Bloomberg sources say that Google plans to crack down on apps that have avoided using the Play Store's in-app purchase billing. Updated guidelines are expected as early as next week that clarify most apps need to use Google billing for in-app content downloads, for game upgrades, and for subscriptions. Google takes 30% of those purchases. The requirement has existed. However, major developers like Netflix and Spotify, they don't use it. They haven't, at least in, up until now. Google removed Epic, as you'll recall, for blatantly circumventing Google billing, but turned a blind eye to some of these other companies. So the company will now give developers time to update their apps to come into compliance. Didn't yeah. Google used to? Didn't Google used to take? It's just an antidote. Didn't they used to take ten percent? Wasn't it that the no, thing? No, I don't think so. I really I, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, but I think it was always thirty. Okay. Of this, I anyway. Thought they, yeah. I thought they started with the ten. All right. But yeah, pretty much everybody does 30. Only Epic takes less than 30 in its own Epic store, right? They take the, I think it's 18% or something, but they take a lot more if you make more than a million dollars, right? Um, so 30 is pretty standard. 
I, I always under the misimpression that Google didn't force you to use Google Pay because I saw these companies like Netflix not using it. I didn't realize that it was technically against the rules. They just weren't enforcing it. And I almost guarantee you that this came up when they were reviewing the court case with Epic. Remember, Epic not only suing Apple, Epic is suing Google, and they're suing Google for kicking them out of the store because Epic didn't use the Google Pay system. And in court, Epic's gonna point to Netflix and Spotify and go, why aren't you making them do it? So Google's mm -hmm. cleaning up their act and saying, all right, we gotta start enforcing this. Netflix, Spotify, you you either have to use Google Pay or not charge people at all. This is, this is the world that Epic has wrought. Are they able to circumvent by just, uh, like what you said, just, just they can't go, uh, sign up for Netflix on the app at all. Like, like they, they just, that, have to go that's to what website. happens on iOS right now. And so okay. presumably if they don't want to use Google pay, that would be the only thing they could do. Gotcha. Hmm. Money. Got to make that money. Money, 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 money. Uh, makes the, makes the app store go around. Well, folks, uh, <laughs> we don't make you pay us any money for daily tech headlines. Go get it. Five minutes a day. Dailytechheadlines.com. <laughs> Speaking of app stores, though, uh, nice we segue. mentioned at the top of the show, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> we mentioned at the top of the show that Amazon got around the Apple App Store with Apple's help. Let us explain. Uh, we mentioned yesterday that Amazon launched a game streaming system called Luna, and we have a few more details about how that works on iOS. As we told you yesterday, it comes through the browser. Luna will be a progressive web app, or PWA. We've told you about those before. It means you can install an icon for Luna on your home screen on iOS, run it separately from the rest of your browser. You're not going to see your other tabs or anything. It'll act like its own app. And technically, it could even work offline, but since Luna is an online game streaming service, that's not really a feature that applies here. It can act pretty much like an app, but without being subject to Apple's App Store rules, because it's really just a very robust website that you're saving to your home screen. In Apple's recent streaming game guidelines, Apple actually wrote, quote, of course, there is always the open internet and web browser apps to reach all users outside of the App Store. They pointed at that and they said, you could just do that if you wanted to. And Amazon said, okay, I guess we want to. Uh, Luna, head of engineering and technology, George Sipolitis, who works for Amazon, said that Amazon worked with Apple's Safari team to make sure, quote, some of the things that weren't there are there and that allowed us to do kind of get where we are today. So they not only cooperated with Apple, Apple's Safari team apparently like added some some functionality for them with their progressive web apps. You would think mm -hmm. Apple would like try to force them into the app store. No, they didn't. Amazon also says they're working with Apple on a native app and will ship one when, quote, we can come up with a good experience. So Amazon's saying like, those new guidelines about the native apps didn't really work with us yet, but we're still working. We're talking with Apple. We're not suing them uh, like Epic is. The Verge's Sean Hollister also wonders when Google, NVIDIA, and Microsoft might follow suit. Google runs Stadia in Chrome already. NVIDIA's GeForce Now made a WebRTC version for the Chromebook. And as Sean points out, yes, there are issues to web apps like controller support questions, lack of all the optimizations you can do on a native app. Uh, and of course on iOS, if you're running a progressive web app, it has to run on WebKit. You don't get a choice of browser, but Amazon was able to make it work by working with Apple. Yeah, th this is uh, fascinating. I, I, when I first heard about this, you know, I, I didn't get as much details as you're talking about here, but just the fact that the controller is a Wi-Fi controller. Mm -hmm. First of all, that was a little scary to hear <laughs> just because of latency and all that. But like, if they solve that issue, uh, that's why it's able to work in something like Microsoft's xCloud right now as it is cannot work because it does not go the, the controller does not go through uh, through Wi-Fi. Uh, so I, you know, I, I find this fascinating I, even more so that Apple like encouraged it. They they uh, and maybe because Amazon's too big to 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 push around. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the, sure. What the reason well, is. Well, I'm sure they worked with Apple Amazon more than they would a, a single unknown developer, you know, right. for sure. But what Apple's position has been, if you're in our app store, we have costs to running the app store. And so our way of recouping those costs are taking a percentage of your sales, whether it's in app or, or charging for a download. And so if you're in our app store, we have to do that. But they've, they're like, if you're a progressive web app, we don't have to do anything. So we're not gonna try to take any of your money. You can do whatever you want there. Nor can they really. Yeah. 
Yeah, they could stop it anyway. That's a really good point. You know, yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, but there's there there there's no argument that they're doing anything that you would have to pay them for if you're just using a web app. Yeah. So it, it yeah it makes me now it it I understand why Stadia's been having problems with them, why X Cloud's been having problems. I mean, the Luna thing didn't just come up a week ago. Like obviously this has been working out for months, maybe you know maybe the last few years. So maybe that's where you know Xbox uh, Xbox and Stadia, Google Stadium, this needs to get to. And if they can, if they can figure that out, they may have to push out some update for the, or just a new controller just to yeah. make it work. But I, I, I'm just well, excited. Stadia about the has a Wi-Fi controller too. Uh, it is so Wi-Fi. They've already, yeah, okay. they're already there. Okay. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Uh, Dark like, like 27 class, US though. says uh, they don't just recoup their costs; they make a profit. Well, yeah, uh, companies make profits. I, I I wasn't trying to say it was altruistic to run the app store, but. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, that's a business for them, whereas progressive web apps is not the business for them. Yep. Well, you can join the conversation in our Discord if you have thoughts on pretty much anything. And join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. We will not take a percentage of your thoughts either. No, we All right, not. let's check out the mailbag. Oh, we got one from Dave from Dry But Cool, St. Louis. Dave, I'm jealous. It's very hot where I am. In episode 3872, Dave says, you talked about the 32-bit Z4, the computer from 1945 that's being brought back to life. Scott remarked that it would be great if we could keep examples of other old computers alive just like that. Dave says, it reminded me of the Living Computer Museum in Seattle. You can even visit their website at livingcomputers.org. They're not open right now, but when I visited there a few years ago with my family, I was not only able to see the old computer, like the first IBM PC I used back in 1984, uh, but they actually had them working, and better yet, they allowed and encouraged visitors to use them. It was like I was transported back in time. Tom, they even have a working TI 994A like you have behind you in your shot. I had one too. Dave says their team of supporters not only keep them and their software going, they figured out ways to make the power supplies more efficient that keep the old mainframes going, but at a fraction of the energy that they did back in the 60s and 70s. That is so cool. It, it reminds me, it, it's a much more organized version of what I'm about to describe, but it reminds me of uh, the computer museum they had at the Goodwill that was up near Dell in northern Austin. I don't know if it's still there anymore, but when I was living in Austin back in the 90s, you could go there and they had a working Apple Leaf. They had a Heath kit and you could go in and play with that stuff. But they also sold old computer equipment there as well. In fact, that's where I bought this TI 994A that's behind me, so, uh, uh, funnily enough. So, yeah, I love that. I, I definitely need to hit the Living Computer Museum next time I'm in Seattle, once I'm allowed to travel to Seattle again. Yeah. I'm glad they're preserving stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for the email, Dave. And, you know, stay cool. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Dan Kolbeck, Philip Less, and John Atwood. Len Peralta has, of course, been busily using his illustrative skills uh, to give us something extra for today's show. What have you drawn for us, Len? Well, you know, this might be a DTNS first uh, in that I'm excited for Luna. Uh, I think it's going to be a pretty interesting experiment for Amazon as they enter this. Uh, but I don't think uh, we've ever been able, I don't think th this might be the first drawing of Luna on the internet ah. uh, since it's been uh, an actual yesterday. drawing of Luna herself. Yes. And we don't know. I mean, it could be, it could maybe non gendered. Who knows? Luna themselves. But, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but Luna's a rule breaker, man. She's, you know, you got like this, uh, going to change cloud gaming, I think, possibly. And uh, are you going to want her? Yes, you are. You're going to want Luna. Um, so this uh, image is, uh, is the possibly the first image of Luna on the internet which is a DTNS exclusive, which is kind of yeah. cool. In um, native and, cloud habitat. <laughs> exactly, and she's in the cloud. Uh, uh, you can get this at uh, Patreon. Uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber at patreon.com forward slash Len, you can get this right now or at my online store at lenperaltstore.com. Oh, I'm going to get her. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now we know. Uh, thanks, Lamar. Uh, <laughs> but also thanks for, for being with us on the show. And we know you're real busy, so let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, I, obviously I, I'm, I'm uh, originally from YouTube. So you can go to YouTube.com slash Lamar Wilson, where I do, you know, lifestyle pop culture type things. This is this is uh, game console season, so expect to see some 
things in the coming days about, you know, all the Xbox Series X and the PS5s and all that if you're interested in that. Um, you know, and I'm also, uh, you know, you go to LamarWilson.com if you want to get all my links to Instagram and even TikTok. TikTok is my fastest growing network, guys. No kidding. I got, yeah. got 10,000 people the other day in one day. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's, cr- yeah, it's, it's going it, nuts. Was it like, there. did you have like a particularly popular TikTok or it just I, was I'm a just, surge? I'm just cute. What <laughs> good that know. song were you lip syncing? <laughs> <laughs> you just had a good hair day. Uh, folks, if you're like, wait, TikTok, uh, that's that's what those creators like Lamar use. Well, we got something for you. Monday, October 5th starts Creators Theme Week on Daily Tech News Show. We'll look at how technology has changed and is still changing, how people create things like visual effects, costume and props, narrative game design. So I know you listen every day. You're going to listen every day. But tell uh, some other folks about it because it's going to be a fun week on Daily Tech News Show, Monday, October 5th. And, of course, you can always support our show at any level and get some perks to thank you at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. If you've got feedback for us, well, we've got an email address, and it's a great place to send it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you'd like to join us live, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you Monday. Bye. Bye. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>